Hey everyone, Chris here. Thanks for checking out the podcast. If you're enjoying it and learning something along with us, please consider becoming a supporting patron at patreon.com slash a teacher of history. Or you could leave a rating and review on iTunes. It would be a huge help. If you'd like to raise your hand and participate along with us, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, at a teacher fist, or shoot me an email, chris at a teacher history.com. All right, let's get on to the next episode. Hello, welcome in to A Teacher of History of the United States. Thanks so much for joining me today. Did you know that President James Monroe received a hero's welcome in cities like Baltimore, Philadelphia, and New York when he traveled around different regions of the country in order to unify the people and meet his constituents face to face? That Andrew Jackson invaded Florida, and seemed to take things a bit too far, which gave Secretary of State John Quincy Adams the negotiating leverage with the Spanish, which eventually led to the U.S. annexing Florida. And that President James Monroe, in 1823, issued the Monroe Doctrine, more or less boxing Europe out of any future colonization efforts of the Western Hemisphere for good, consolidating American power all to ourselves. Did you know all of this? Maybe, maybe not. Get your notebooks out, because we will cover that and more in episode 111, The Era of Good Feelings. All right, everyone, welcome in to episode 111, The Era of Good Feelings. And I'm ready to get going here. But first, I'd like to read uh, the most recent review on iTunes, which I thought was pretty great. Um, and something that I, it is probably worth uh, reminding myself of. Uh, it's by Boomer106. He actually put it on New Year's Eve. He said, get ready because you're going to end up loving this. Oh, thanks, man. Uh, admittedly, the audio quality of the first few episodes left me unsubscribing, which... I get, Uh, but I came back when I had a long road trip. It gets better. Either skip the first few or muscle through, but it will be worth it. Great way to get a chronological history of our nation, uh, of our nation's history without too much detail. Uh, Just got stationed at Fort Meade this year and listened to Chris from Florida to Maryland. Uh, Yeah, buddy, I'm right down the road. Keep up the strong work. Big fan. Thanks for the review. Uh, I appreciate it. It is just once again a reminder uh, that the audio quality of the first, gosh, however many episodes, um, leaves a bit to be desired. I didn't really know exactly what I was doing uh, when it came to audio stuff when I started this podcast, and I have been really trying to carve out time to go back and re-record them, but with a job and family and continuing to write new episodes, it's a lot harder than I thought it would be. But I will I will continue to try to uh, figure out a way to do that because I don't want people like he or she unsubscribing um, after the first few episodes because, as you know, if you're listening to episode 111, it does get a lot better. So last week we wrapped up the presidency of James Madison and welcomed in our fifth president, James Monroe. I spent some time last episode discussing the impact that Madison had on the United States in general and the presidency specifically. We then shortly covered the election of 1816 and the inauguration of James Monroe. As I've mentioned before, and we will get into uh, in detail in this episode, the era of President James Monroe, especially in the first term, is often referred to as the era of good feelings. This is because there have been few times in American history that well, if any, saw a citizenry as optimistic, progressive, and united, and ambitious as they were during the uh, first four to six years of the presidency of James Monroe. 
The American quote-unquote victory, and by the way, I may be referring to this victory over the British uh, one or two more times in this episode, and keep in mind, whenever I say that, it's sort of with air quotes because in the end it was not really a victory, but it felt like a victory, and politically that was really all that mattered. So the American quote-unquote victory over the British in the War of 1812 seemed to, to, to be the elixir that the electorate needed to temporarily put aside their political divisions and unite for a common shared cause. With Britain finally out of the way, no longer lingering in the West and in Canada, and with the Native Americans having chosen the losing side of the war, Americans felt free, unencumbered, and excited about their future prospects. What we will see during this time is that the U.S. viewed this victory as a catalyst for domestic growth and expansion and an opportunity for them to reassert their power and independence in the area of foreign affairs and foreign diplomacy. Americans will begin to increase their focus on westward expansion. They'll recharter the National Bank, look to expand into the South, and take increased pride in their booming manufacturing. With all of this considered, infrastructure became a priority and only further enhanced the connection between America's people and places. Last week, I mentioned that James Monroe was a good friend of John Marshall, and he was. What I didn't mention last week, though, was that James Monroe and John Marshall had a bit of a political falling out there for a while. We know that Monroe was a Democratic Republican and one of the most effective Democratic Republicans in our history at that. Well, John Marshall was a Federalist. If you remember, his appointment to the Chief Justice position in the Supreme Court came during John Adams' midnight appointments. Recognizing that the Democratic-Republican Party had taken control of both the legislature and the presidency following the election of 1800, Adams and Congress worked to pack the court system with as many Federalists as they could prior to leaving office, and John Marshall, if you remember, was one of them. When I reviewed this event in more detail in a previous episode, I mentioned that John Marshall was not only going to be on the Supreme Court for a really long time, but his Federalist views on constitutional authority of the federal government was going to have a significant impact on the direction of our nation for years to come. Bill and I may end up doing an extra credit episode on two specific court cases during this time period that encapsulate this concept, and I think if we decide to go that route, it would give you a much better understanding of the dynamics between the Democratic Republicans in the executive and legislative branches and the limitations that the Federalist courts um, imposed upon some of the more uh, purest Democratic Republicans politically. But I will cover uh, these court cases in a, a more brief approach during these episodes. So if Bill and I don't end up end up doing that, hopefully you'll still understand it and be familiar with it. But uh, like I said, we're hoping to schedule a deep dive on them coming up soon. And one of those court cases we'll cover in this episode. And we'll begin to see how the Democratic-Republican approach to government following this war actually began to line up a bit with the Federalist you know, leaning John Marshall and his court. Um, and, and as we see this begin to happen, uh, naturally, whenever this happens, there's always a split, and that will be coming uh, in Monroe's second term. But we'll get into that in more detail in a few minutes. Following Monroe's inauguration, it was clear just how popular this guy really was. The party celebrating his entry into the presidency was a blowout. The National Intelligencer described the scene with so many people that it was impossible to know exactly how many were there. They just knew there were too many to estimate. They then concluded that it was certainly the largest gathering that the nation's capital had ever seen. Eliza Otis, who was the wife of one of the Massachusetts senators who was present for the inauguration, described the scene, saying, quote, The broad Pennsylvania Avenue, three miles in length, crowded as far as the eye could extend with carriages of every description. The sidewalks with foot passengers, men, women, and children, fiddles, fifes, and drums all together. A scene picturesque and animating. Following the ceremony, the Monroes hosted a reception at their home where Eliza continued to be frustrated with the size of the crowd, complaining that, quote, it was an hour before we could get to the door and then pushing our way through all the scavengers and washwomen of the city who were laying hands on the waiter of cake and refreshments. 
About a month after the inauguration, James Madison officially moved out of Washington, D.C. With the glamour of Monroe now taking the attention of the American people, many quickly forgot or wanted to forget the presidency of Madison. Although there was a lot to love, which we covered last week, Madison certainly did not go out with a bang. When he and Dolly boarded the steamboat to head home, there were, quote, no people and no friends to accompany them. But let's return our focus to President Monroe. Like he did in all other positions he had held in government, James Monroe was committed to giving his full effort and energy to maximize his effectiveness as president. In order to do that, he wanted to be sure he chose the right people for his cabinet positions. And of course, it is 1816, so by people, we mean white men. The most important post in his cabinet? Secretary of State. He gave this to the eldest son of President John Adams, John Quincy Adams. What we will see during Monroe's presidency is although the war is over, there are still foreign powers surrounding the U.S. on land and sea. Having a very good Secretary of State would not only keep us out of future unnecessary conflicts, but could also potentially leverage our strengths in negotiations with these powers for more favorable trade relationships or acquisitions of land. Like I mentioned, John Quincy Adams was the eldest son of John Adams. He was highly respected and in some ways was a chip off the old block. He wasn't as liberal as Monroe, nor was he as conservative as his father. He was a bit of a moderate for this time period. He had served as minister to Russia and ambassador to Britain and was critical in the negotiations to end the War of 1812. He was viewed by many to be a fantastic and pretty obvious choice. And some of you may know that the sixth president of the United States following James Monroe will be none other than Secretary of State John Quincy Adams. William Crawford was appointed Secretary of Treasury, as I mentioned last episode. Monroe then offered the position of Secretary of War to the incredibly popular senator from Kentucky, Henry Clay. Clay, though, was insulted. Who the hell wants to be Secretary of War when there's no war going on? What a waste of my political talent. While choosing John Quincy Adams as Secretary of State seemed like a home run hire to most, Clay, naturally, believed he would have been better and should have been given the post. Henry Clay was incredibly ambitious, and he will prove himself to be one of the most skilled politicians that America has ever seen, especially when it comes to working out deals. But that skill, as we will find out, never translated to the success of presidential elections. So with Clay's ego getting in the way of what could have been a great plan, Monroe turned to another former war hawk to be his secretary of war, John C. Calhoun from South Carolina. We'll be hearing a lot more about him in the future decades. One thing Monroe was particularly focused on was trying to do everything he could to ensure that a Federalist revival did not happen during his presidency. He just was, I mean, he could not sleep at night when thinking about the Hartford Convention. He was so frustrated with what the Federalists had done during the end of the War of 1812 to undermine America's um, efforts politically and uh, with regards to the war. In order to make this a reality, to keep the Federalists from not having any type of revival, Monroe took a page out of George Washington's book and decided to go on a nationwide tour. Remember when I mentioned that Monroe read the biography of Washington that was written by John Marshall and would try to emulate his behavior after the great American Cincinnatus? Well, this is one such example of that. So Washington had toured the nation in order to show how the U.S. president would be different than the English monarch that the American people had grown accustomed to at that point in time. Monroe, seeing this as effective, was focused on doing something similar, but he wanted to better understand the wants and needs of the people, become familiar with Americans in all parts of the nation, and even be able to see the vulnerable points of the eastern coast with his own two eyes. This nationwide tour is what really kicked off what historians refer to as the era of good feelings. I mentioned previously that by the end of Madison's presidency, many respected Monroe more than Madison and viewed him as really the de facto leader of the nation. 
Well, based on the receptions that Monroe received on his tour, it seemed to be a pretty accurate uh, assumption. As Monroe entered cities like Baltimore, Philadelphia, and New York, thousands and thousands of people showed up to greet him and celebrate his arrival. Veterans of the Revolutionary War were showing their respect to him. Church bells rang, shots fired, and cannons boomed. In fact, there was so much love in the air that when Monroe entered Boston, hundreds of children lined up to greet him, with the girls wearing a white dress and either a red or white rose, representing each political party, showing that both were united under his leadership. With such a reception, the Columbian Sentinel proclaimed that Monroe's presidency would, quote, remove the prejudices and harmonize feelings, annihilate dissension and make us one people. Rest assured that the president will be a president not of a party, but of a great and powerful nation. It is the beginning of an era of good feelings. Monroe, when attending a dinner with the governor of Boston in which the guests cheered his arrival, men such as Federalist John Adams and Timothy Pickering were all aboard the Monroe train. They were there greeting him, smiling ear to ear, and applauding his arrival. And this is really surprising because we know Adams' history with the Democratic Republican from Virginia. And Timothy Pickering, the former Secretary of State, was the one who recalled Monroe from Paris and more or less forced his resignation as minister to France. It was crazy to see these three men sitting down at dinner together. Heck, it wasn't that long ago that political rivals like these, they wouldn't even speak to each other. They wouldn't even look at each other. Hell, they wouldn't even pass each other on the same side of the street. It's pretty amazing what a victory in war will do to provoke nationalist pride. After finishing up in New England, Monroe then went to the Midwest and circled back toward Washington, D.C. He was proud of himself for what he thought was an act that had united the American people and rid the nation of party divisions. With his nationwide tour behind him, Monroe was welcomed to an upgraded and revamped presidential mansion, which was given the name the White House. So we know Monroe was highly respected by the American public, and his election did bring a sense of national pride to many, putting a stamp on the seeming American victory from the War of 1812. And I guess electing a war hero will have a tendency to do that. But what else was going on in America at this time on a broader scale to warrant such a reputation for increased nationalism and a catchphrase like the era of good feelings? Certainly, it wasn't just a presidential tour around the Northeast, the Midwest, and by the way, he also toured the South. I, I'm not going to get into that in detail, but he did tour the Southern states too. Um, it had to be more than just a, a tour, right? Well, I think the War of 1812 and the challenges that went along with it reminded this generation of Americans that the revolutionary forefathers dealt with some of the same issues. And because of that, I'm going to talk about some of the economic changes that happened during this time period. I'm also going to talk about some of the judicial nationalism we see from uh, decisions handed down by the Marshall Court, and then we'll talk about foreign affairs and what the U.S. was doing at that point to consolidate itself and um, put itself in a more favorable position with our foreign allies and enemies. So, like I mentioned, um, some of the issues that Americans experienced during the Revolutionary War, especially with finding the funds to fight the war, cropped up again during the War of 1812. So with that in mind, some type of progress toward creating a nationalist economic program that could prevent repeating this for a third time began to take hold. The first order of business was to recharter the National Bank. Relying on the state banks to finance the war in 1812 just did not work. With the state banks issuing way too many notes to meet the demand, the value of those notes dropped precipitously. Of course, and when it was obvious they weren't backed by gold and silver, they dropped even more. This led to the inevitable inflation problem that the nation dealt with during the war. What America needed was some type of fiscal stability, and that was only going to happen with a federal bank. They could never rely on the numerous state banks to work with such synchronicity. 
So, in 1816, the Second Bank of the United States was officially chartered and was capitalized with $35 million. After establishing the bank, or I should say re-establishing the bank, Congress then turned their attention to trade. The war had been a boon for U.S. manufacturing, as they say, necessity is the mother of invention. Knowing this, it was incredibly important for Congress to protect this new, growing American industry. Because unsurprisingly, after the war was over, Britain once again flooded American markets with goods, especially iron and textiles, which was very predictable because that was one of the primary motivations they had for ending the war in the first place. Recognizing that these lower-priced British goods could kill the American manufacturing industry while it was still in its infancy, the first protective tariff in U.S. history was passed, the Tariff of 1816. The revenue made from this tariff, along with some money from the National Bank, were earmarked to make improvements to internal transportation networks, especially in the Mid-Atlantic and the West. Unfortunately for Congress, this bill was passed in early 1817 and vetoed by Madison while he was on his way out the door. While President Madison was in favor of the outcomes of this bill, he didn't believe it was the federal government's role to be responsible for such a project, especially with so much of it surrounding the local challenges. With the bill vetoed and Madison leaving office, it was up to the Monroe presidency or the courts to clarify how to best move forward. And I think this is really important to note that Madison vetoed this. Because with Monroe's presidency, we begin to see a bit of a shift in the Democratic-Republican platform. They really begin to embrace this nationalist sentiment that is coursing through the hearts and minds of the American people. And with that, they are much more willing to hear arguments about supporting and empowering the federal government if it will help America become more stable economically, um, politically, or with regard to foreign affairs. So, enter Chief Justice John Marshall. Now, if you've been listening to this podcast and something I mentioned earlier in this episode, you know Marshall was a Federalist through and through. And with the war in the rearview mirror, many Democratic Republicans, like I said, take a more nationalistic view of things, which more closely fell in line with some of Marshall's view on the role of government, because the Federalist definitely had a view that the federal government should maintain supreme authority and have much more power than the old school Democratic Republicans did, men like uh, James Madison to a certain extent. During his time as Chief Justice, Marshall made two things abundantly clear. The Supreme Court was the supreme authority on the interpretation of the Constitution, and legal contracts were pretty bulletproof. And while, one, uh, those were two very direct, easy to pick up on from the Marshall Court, um, another thing that was happening indirectly through his decisions was the supremacy of the federal government over the states and the loose interpretation of how much power the federal government actually had. Marshall reinforced the value he placed on legal contracts with his decision in 1810 in Fletcher v. Peck that overturned a state law in Georgia that violated a legal contract. And what this does is this, of course, limits state power and state authority, placing the legal contract um, as more sacrosanct than the power of the state. But it was the two decisions Marshall's court made in 1819 that really continued this nationalist momentum. The first was the case of Dartmouth College v. Woodward. In this case, the state of New Hampshire tried to amend the charter of Dartmouth College in order to allow more public control over it. Marshall's court ruled that Dartmouth's original royal charter in 1769 was a contract protected by the Constitution. Therefore, New Hampshire couldn't alter it without prior consent to Dartmouth. This was a big deal because, in essence, the court was ruling that a charter or act of incorporation was a contract that could not be interfered with by the states. Once again, a ruling that limited state power. So basically, this meant that the state could not control private entities. Therefore, states could not assume that private companies would take the same approach to societal needs as they would. 
Therefore, they needed to clearly define their roles moving forward, and the state needed to take on more responsibility in getting done what it felt like it needed to get done without trying to leverage its authority to um, manipulate or direct private entities toward helping them support their goals. The second case to make headlines in 1819 was McCulloch v. Maryland, and this was a really important case. In 1818, the state of Maryland placed a tax on a branch of the Bank of the United States that was in Maryland. James McCulloch, who was the cashier of that branch of the bank, refused to pay the tax. This set the stage for a Supreme Court case that would solve two very important questions. Number one, and this one was very overdue, was it constitutional in the first place to have a Bank of the United States? And number two, could a state tax federal property within its borders? The Supreme Court responded resoundingly to both questions, leaving no doubt. They ruled unanimously to the the first question that the establishment of the bank was constitutional and that it had the authority to regulate the nation's currency and finances. Additionally, the court said that as long as the purpose was legitimate and within the scope of the Constitution, Congress had full power to use any means not expressly forbidden in the Constitution to achieve that end. And this is a very loose interpretation of the Constitution. John Marshall is, you know, you have two different thoughts on this. Um, You have the uh, very conservative view of the Constitution, which was sort of the bread and butter of the Democratic Republicans, in which the federal government can do everything listed in the Constitution. And then John Marshall uh, and the more federalist leaning court is saying, well, no, not really. They can do a lot more than that. And as long as it's necessary and proper and you can justify it toward the overall good of the nation, you can do not pretty much anything, but you can do a lot more as long as it's not explicitly said that you can't do it. And that, of course, as you can imagine, is a huge difference. With regards to the second question, right? Uh, Could a state tax federal property within its own borders? The court stated that the state of Maryland had no authority to tax the branch of the federal government. Marshall famously stated that the power to tax was the power to destroy. What he was basically saying was that if you have the power to tax something, you could tax it so much that you could essentially destroy it. Because of this obvious reality, Marshall contended that the founders had no intention to allow a state to control the federal government, or in an extreme case of taxation, render one part of it basically useless. This was a critically important case. It not only reinforced once and for all, beyond all doubts, that the Bank of the United States was constitutional, but it also validated the supremacy of the federal government over the states. This was, up to this point in American history, the boldest statement of these implied powers and the interpretation of implied powers that I mentioned a moment ago. This was the boldest statement of that so far in our history. So we've established some of the ways that the government uh, adapted a nationalistic mindset with regards to the economy and discussed how a few court cases reinforced that approach and limited the power of the states. Now let's turn to the last portion of this episode by checking out what was going on in foreign policy during this time. When talking about America's foreign policy and diplomatic nationalism, there is no one who played a bigger role in this, predictably, than Secretary of State John Quincy Adams. John Quincy served as Monroe's Secretary of State during his entire eight-year term. Originally a Federalist like his father, he broke ranks with the party over its refusal to endorse policies of expansion, which makes sense because during his time as Secretary of State, that is his primary focus. Adams' first major victory in this role came in his negotiations with the British. If you remember, neither side conceded much of anything following the War of 1812, and there were still some unresolved issues between the two nations. John Quincy, in 1817 and 1818, struck two major agreements with the British, 
The rush bagot Treaty of 1817 saw the British agree to strictly limit their naval armaments along the Great Lakes, more or less demilitarizing the U.S.-Canadian border. The next year, the Anglo-American Accords took it one step further, giving Americans fishing rights off the coast of Newfoundland, settling the border between the U.S. and Canada along the 19th parallel, and giving the U.S. and Britain joint control of the Oregon Territory, which is present-day Oregon State, Washington State, Idaho, and almost all of British Columbia. Now, few people know about these agreements, but they were really important. Finally, the British were out of the way in the Great Lakes, and for all intents and purposes outside of the Oregon Territory, they were gone from having a presence in the United States of America. John Quincy negotiated a treaty that the Northwest Territory and New England were both happy with. And with that, he turned his attention to the South and the West. John Quincy really wanted to somehow pry Florida away from Spain, and he wanted undisputed access to the Pacific somehow. At this point, everything south of Oregon Territory was technically Spanish territory. Thus, they controlled the rest of the Pacific coast. Adams was pressuring Spain to come to the negotiating table, but he was struggling to make much progress until Andrew Jackson bailed him out. While Adams was in the middle of trying to negotiate with Spain, in March of 1818, Andrew Jackson took his troops across the Florida border and began raiding Native American camps. They then seized two Spanish forts and even executed two British men who were accused of selling arms to natives. It is pretty commonly known that Andrew Jackson was a ruthless military leader, and he was arguably going above and beyond the orders he was given down in Florida. But there was no one there to really stop him. And this is something we'll talk about, by the way, in much more detail next episode, this campaign into Florida. And while John Quincy may not have agreed with his tactics, he couldn't deny that it was incredibly helpful for him in his negotiations. Adams explained to the Spanish that in his mind, Jackson was just doing his duty and defending U.S. interests down in Florida, and everyone at the negotiating table, including Adams, were pretty sure that he was likely going to do something similar again sooner rather than later. With a famous American war general reaching havoc in Florida and the Spanish having no real way to stop him, they realized that their goose was cooked. Adams and Jackson had the leverage, and they better negotiate something before it was too late. Because once it's too late, they're just going to have to give it away. So that's exactly what they did. In the Transcontinental Treaty of 1819, the U.S. was able to annex East Florida, and Spain allowed the U.S. to keep West Florida, an area that the U.S. had claimed, but the Spanish had refused to acknowledge. So basically, the U.S. got all of present-day Florida. John Quincy was also able to settle on a border between the Spanish territory and the jointly claimed Oregon territory. In essence, Spain gave up all its claims to the Pacific Northwest, which finally gave the U.S. access to this Pacific coast that they so desperately were looking for. The U.S. reiterated its belief that they had ceded control or I should say they were see, they were given control of the Texas Territory with the Louisiana Purchase. Um, but the Spanish, you know, the Spanish heard them out, but the Spanish disagreed. But it was important for John Quincy just to reinforce that we actually believe we have control of part of that area. And I know you don't agree with us, but it's important that we say it formally once again. And then the U.S. paid $5 million in debt that the Spanish government had owed American citizens. And the deal was done. The U.S. gained Florida. The U.S. now have undisputed control uh, jointly with Britain of the Oregon Territory. The U.S. reminded the Spanish um, that they think that we have some claim to uh, Texas, which is, of course, foreboding in the future. And the U.S. said that they would pay off $5 million in debt. One of the factors they enabled the U.S. to come to such favorable terms with the Spanish was that the British were silent during Jackson's march through Florida. Uh, 
Although a couple British subjects were killed and the Spanish lamb was being run roughshod, the British made the calculated decision that this fight was not worth getting involved in. In their minds, if the U.S. was able to squeeze the Spanish out of more of the Western Hemisphere, that was in the end probably good for, for Britain too. They wanted to maintain a positive trading relationship with the U.S., and they had their eyes set on Latin American trade markets. They figured if the British and the U.S. were to dominate that market on their own, they could maximize the profit off of it. To this end, the British and U.S., or the British tried to get the U.S. to hatch a plan to ensure that it stayed that way. In 1823, British Foreign Minister George Cannon proposed that the U.S. and Britain issue a joint declaration opposing any recolonization efforts of South America by any other European nation. Additionally, no one could help Spain in trying to get their lost land back. But of course, there was a catch. Britain, see, look, Britain could see the writing on the wall, right? The U.S. was consolidating its power and was clearly a head and shoulders the most powerful nation in the Western Hemisphere, and it wasn't even close. If the U.S. wanted to press down on the gas pedal in an attempt to dominate more of the Western Hemisphere, Britain knew it would be really hard to stop them. So the catch was that um, George Cannon proposed. He said that if they were to make this joint declaration, the U.S., of course, would have the benefit of being supported by Britain, one of the most powerful nations in the world. In return, the U.S. would promise not to annex any Spanish territory. From Britain's perspective, this would do two things. Number one, it would throw a bone to the Spanish to keep them at bay and make them feel more secure and that their land was somehow being protected by the word of um, the crown. Additionally, it would also prevent the U.S. from pursuing ambitious expansion like Britain was afraid they would. And this way, they would be able to limit the growth of the U.S., at least in the short term. But John Quincy was having none of this. He knew that there was a reason why Britain was so interested in issuing a joint declaration with the U.S., and it was because the U.S. was in prime position for expansion, and there was little anyone else in Europe was going to do about it. So with that in mind, President Monroe, with John Quincy's urging, rejected the British offer. It was a new era for the United States of America, and they were no longer going to be beholden to Britain. Additionally, John Quincy and other expansionists had visions of the annexation of lands like Texas, California, and Cuba, and they thought that it was totally possible for these types of things to happen in the next 20 to 30 years. So in December of 1823, Monroe issued the Monroe Doctrine. The basic premise of it was similar to the proposal from Britain. They took George Cannon's idea, and they ran with it, except Britain wasn't included. Monroe stated that the Americas, quote, are henceforth not to be considered as subjects for future colonization by any European power. In return, Monroe pledged not to interfere in any internal affairs of European states. While there was still land in North and South America that were territories of European nations, the Monroe Doctrine more or less told these European nations two things. Number one, there will be no new colonization from Europe in the Americas. So whatever grand plans you have on expanding into the Western Hemisphere, it's not going to happen. And number two, once you lose these territories, likely through a revolution similar to the Haitian Revolution or um, a conflict with the U.S. even, um, you're going for good. No recolonization. If you try to recolonize, you'll have to deal with the U.S., as you pack up your things, I'd like you to consider just how much progress was being made in Monroe's first term. While the Monroe Doctrine, which you may have picked up on, was established later, actually toward the end of his second term, most everything else we discussed happened in his first term. The Supreme Court was making their presence felt, having a significant impact on pushing a more nationalist agenda, reinforcing the supremacy of the federal government and protecting private contracts. And, in essence limiting and weakening the power and authority of individual states. The bank was reestablished, and the pain of two wars had now woken Americans up to the reality that they likely needed more consolidation, consistency, and reliability with their money. 
This will give the U.S. leverage in the international market and will continue to allow for its quick and expansive growth over the next century. Although we will talk about how it didn't always go so smoothly in some episodes coming up. And lastly, we saw that Monroe's administration, spearheaded by the brilliant and talented John Quincy, was tying up loose ends with Europe and setting the U.S. up for some real power moves in the future. The era of good feelings was a great time to be an American. The public was pretty united and Monroe was making things happen with both, in both foreign and domestic affairs. But it won't be quite as smooth at the very end of his first term and into his second term. Things get a bit more tricky. And next week, we'll dive into more detail about some of that. We'll talk about the expedition that Andrew Jackson took into Florida in detail, because I think it's worth going over and really fascinating stuff. Um, We'll talk about the Panic of 1819, the Missouri Compromise, Monroe's re-election, and we'll tie up some other loose ends from his second term. Thanks for listening, and hopefully now you can take pride in knowing just a little bit more about the history of the United States. Class dismissed. Class dismissed.